Okay, we're picking up with part four of the machine learning with Amaral series. Uh, now we're moving on to training and testing and getting into predictive aspects of machine learning. So up till now, we have been basically describing our existing data. And when we want to focus on prediction, we need to take a slightly different approach. Um, so once again, this is a, a basic overview, basic run through of, of a topic that has many different levels of treatment in machine learning um, literature and lessons. So often we don't have, or, or I would say always, we don't have data about the future itself. We have to pretend in some way that we are going to um, test our data on some future data. So we have an existing data set. Typically, we have an existing data set, um, and we want to train a model on it. We want to build a model based on something we know about how that data works. But if we build the model on all of the data, then we lose the opportunity to see how the model performs on unknown data, meaning data that is that model has not seen it before. Um, so it's it's again easy to overfit something if you are taking um, too much data as an input and not testing it on enough as an output. So what we do is we split the data that we have into what's called training and testing sets. The model is built off of the training data and then the testing data that's been set aside is what we use to apply our model to, see what the predictions our model generates are, and then compare them to the reality of what was that data, what was in that testing data set. Um, so again, I'll give you a link here to um, a discussion of how this, this works. Um, and in this case, I think I will pull that link up so that we can have a, a better look at it. So this is also called, another, another aspect of this is cross-validation, which we're gonna also going to apply here. So validation is just, in this case, another word for testing. So the simplest way to do this would be to just do it once. Uh, to take our training data and testing data, uh, setting aside the training data just one time. Um, if we, but we're missing an opportunity there. Uh, we actually have a full data set and we can split that data a number of different ways. So in the image that you see on this blog page here, uh, the data has been split five different ways. Um, the first column, that first chunk of data has been set aside as the testing data. In the second column, uh, the second fifth of data has been set aside. And the other first, third, fourth, and fifth chunks have been um, used as training data and so on up through the fifth um, chunk. It's actually labeled as K, but I'm just referring to what's on screen there as the five pieces. So this way we are insulating ourselves from anomalies in any one particular validation set. We're training the data. We're getting a, a training data grouping that's re representative of the entire data, not just um, four-fifths of it. And we also have the advantage of being able to run our modeling five different times, um, which can insulate us against some of those random effects like we saw in k-means that, you know, you run something once and it's a bit sensitive to the initial starting point. You get something not usual as your result. So we can set up the training and test splits a number of different ways. We can set up the number of iterations really as many times as you'd like. Uh, depending on your computational limitations. Um, and there's again an art to this. Uh, you want to ensure that your training set is largish, but it, it's dependent, I think, more on the number of observations than the proportion of the data set. 
and the testing set also should be of a reasonable size um, but it doesn't there, there's no hard and fast rule for the percentage that you apply um, if you have a smallish data set you know you you want to lean to having enough observations in your training data set that that you can get meaningful results so an 80 20 split like we saw uh, in that in this illustration is reasonable for many cases but it's not required um, so for this section of data we are going to um, again just restrict uh, what we're looking at to a subset so I'm eliminating a lot of the variables that are um, not of interest to us and a lot of the character variables as well let, let me just uh, review here what we are getting rid of in lines 513 and 514 so we're not keeping the summons number we're not keeping the plate ID that's the actual license plate number uh, we're not keeping the issue date of the ticket um, unfortunately in this data set the date field is not numeric it's actually recorded as a character variable and it's um, it would also require a lot of cleanup to work with effectively if you were interested in changing patterns over time but again for this demo purposes I'm, I'm not going to use that the street codes so we'd already gotten rid of the, some of this data in earlier steps but I'm getting rid of it in the you know the final the big sample that is going to be the basis for things um, so let me just run those commands again it takes a little bit longer for the um, the 42 million observations although it's performance is getting better it seems um, and now we're going to um, introduce something called uh, in machine learning lingo is called one hot encoding uh, in other um, other pr programming languages we might call it a dummy variable uh, let me pull up my little notepad here so we can uh, so I'm talking about one hot encoding oh, I could type and it, it's actually the same thing as a dummy variable if you've heard of dummy variables which is the way that they refer to it in many social science disciplines we are encoding our data in zeros and ones so for the county uh, for the for New York City we have Bronx we have Queens we have Kings County which is Brooklyn we have uh, New York County which is Manhattan and we have uh, Richmond County which is Staten Island right so if we want to do something that's geographically based uh, we'd want to convert these text fields into something that can be numerically incorporated into other um, other processes so for uh, a parking ticket that occurred in the Bronx what we would do is we would have an indicator variable called um, Bronx uh, let's call it Bronx one for one one hot right and if something occurred in the Bronx it would have an entry of zero uh, if it did not occur in the Bronx it would have an entry sorry if if it occurred in the Bronx it would have an entry of one if it did not occur in the Bronx it would have an entry of zero right so original data let's say we had a a few elements of original data like this um, that would be converted and we'd keep that original data so we would then convert it into something like this and I'm, I'm simplifying by not typing everything but for Bronx we'd have a one for the Bronx but a zero for the other uh, counties for Queens we might see something like one zero zero one zero for Richmond we'd see something like zero zero one um, I've omitted the other two counties just for that quick example uh, so this is can be done automatically by the function one hot 
from ML tools. It's called one hot because it's encoded as a one or a zero, which is like a one or an ought in British pronunciation, and somehow that got it got slurred over to one hot along the way. Not exactly sure of the story of that, but that's um, where the one hot comes from. So what I'm going to do is going to take the county variable and convert it to a factor. Factor meaning that in in R it's been converted to uh, a numeric representation so that um, there's a like a one, two, three, four encoding for that that variable and it's no longer just a pure text variable. Uh, and then I'm going to take that factor variable and uh, also provide a, a one hot encoding of it. So so I created the variable county2 as this new variable. Now I can do a table of um, parking sample county2 and it looks like this. So I have um, 43,000 entries with no entry and notice this is a bit messy data, right? So it's we have BK, which is presumably Brooklyn. We also have K for King. So there's 88,000 Kings, one that's spelled out as Kings, and 9,600 Brooklyn. Um, now, if I again, if I need to clean this data and be precise about it, I should probably re-encode all of those Brooklyns and Kings to be all under K. Uh, but I'm going to be very sloppy here and since there are not too many you know the the number that are actually k predominate i'm not going to worry too much I, i'm just interested in the general predictive um, results but again you want to be aware this is something you want to be aware of when you're working with the data um, the bronx seems to be okay uh, manhattan gets encoded mostly as ny but there's a thousand MNs floating out there. Queens, again, we have some inconsistency, Q or QN, and Richmond and Staten Island, there's some blurry boundaries there too. So th this is also very typical of real world data that one of your major issues is just gonna be the, the data quality. Things are not standardized, and uh, depending on how close you wanna get to being perfectly clean, you're gonna have to spend more time in um, in cleaning up the data. All right, so now we are going to we're going to see that um, variable um, blended into our uh, future models. But I, I did want to introduce this um, topic separately because it's something you'll you'll often have to do with categorical data. All right, so. Now let's talk about um, the general generic method that you might want to use to deal with uh, this predictive predictive data modeling. And there is a package called Carrot, which is the premier uh, place for doing this kind of work in R. It's been around for a while. It has a lot of um, powerful features. And so I'm going to run through a built-in example using the um, iris data set, which is a very small data set of um, measurements of flowers. You may have seen it in other contexts. Uh, but just so we can do this at a small scale and run quickly, I'm going to do this example. So there's a function. All these functions that we're going to work with are from the caret package uh, called create data partition. So create data partition lets us specify a proportion of the data. Here I'm saying 80% of the data is going to be set aside as the in train, in the training data set data. And I can also create folds of that data using a separate function called create folds. Um, that's in line 529. Uh, but in the examples I'm using, it's going to actually iterate on its own. 
um, a number of times. So I'm, I'm not going to implement the folds uh, right here. Um, I, I formally specify the training and testing data by saying that the training data is the ones that have the row numbers in train and the testing data are the, the complement of that minus in train. If we want to see what this in train object looks like, we can see that it's actually just uh, like a listing. Let's do the head of the in train. of um, numbers. It's not really in a format that is uh, um, super readable on its own, but it, this is the 80% row numbers that have been selected. So I did run these, yes. And now I can use the train control function to fit the model. Um, and I have an option of many different methods. So we're going to talk about the methods in just a moment. Uh, but CV here is cross-validation. right? So here I'm asking for 10 repetitions to cross-validate the model. And the nice thing about Carrot is, you know, it takes care of all these details for you. So it can, you know, it, it just kind of jumps in and does that. If you look at the names of this object that have been created, um, it's it's actually got a lot of things that it's done behind the scenes um, and typically then what we would do is apply the the result of train control to then finally actually train the model itself so train in this case uh, takes our here we specify our model so the outcome variable, the response variable, the depend, dependent variable, um, whichever terminology you'd like to use is first, followed by a tilde, and then the dot here means we're training, training it against all the other variables. So the entire rest of the data set is being used to explain species. Um, specify the data, specify the method, now in this case we're using a random forest that's RF. Uh, random forest is actually kind of a, a combined method that um, iterates among several different options and then works to get the best blended outcome of those often used with decision trees. Um, so multiple decision trees create the forest um, and uh, once again What's great about Carrot is that it just implements this very transparently. You don't have to think too much about how it is uh, iterating and you know doing all that. And, but that process is controlled by this fit control that we previously specified. So that the 10 iterations, the cross-validation method is being applied thanks to our inclusion of this step. So let's run that. And you'll see that this does, even though this is just the iris data set, very small, 120 observations, uh, it had to think for a moment. didn't quite pop back with an instant result. And what did we get? What is our fit model? Um, so we have 120 samples, three classes. So we're trying to actually predict whether the flower is a setosa, is a versicolor, or is a virginica. And we have um, this sort of basic statement of that you know it's it's tried the model, it's cross validated ten times, and the parameter that was used was uh, three as the optimal model, and the the kappa here is the measure of the fit against the uh, the performance against the test data. The accuracy is the performance against the training data, which you know we hope that's good, but that's not really the final thing that we're interested in. Uh, kappa is is what happens when we when we push the model to our testing, and we hope that our original model, which performed well on the training data, will continue to perform well on the testing data, and have a high kappa. 
And then we can examine the final model. This is line 539 in the code, which shows us what's called the confusion matrix, which illustrates how things have been classified. So there's an error rate of 4.17%. Um, all of the setosas were classified as setosa, so that's perfect. Um, of the versicolors, 37 were classified as versicolor, but two were classified as virginica. So that's um, a, a virginica being classified. When we have a virginica that's a versicolor, that's, that's an error, that's a false um, positive, if I'm not com confusing my terminology there. Um, and likewise for virginica, um, three flowers were misclassified as um, as versicolor when they were in fact virginica. So that confusion matrix gives us a sense of how things have been, how the performance of our model went. Uh, you can read more at the link here which gives you a whole tutorial on cross-validation. And let's just go ahead and continue here and we'll talk about the same methods but applying it to our parking data. Uh, so I'm going to do the same thing, create a data partition, and in this case I'm specifying that the Y that I want to predict is the vehicle year. And I'm only going to take 1% of the data as training, 10%, excuse me, 0.1 proportion, uh, because I have 420,000 observations in the sample, um, I don't want to um, again have something that runs really slowly. Uh, I tried this with the other proportion and when, we, when you get into the cross validation you're repeating things 10 times even for our smaller data set uh, there's a, a bit of a lag here that I don't want to subject you to in video but you can try it out. You can try out different proportions there. Uh, once again I split the data into part into the training and testing park train park test um, I specify my um, training method ten tenfold cross validation um, and then run the model with the train function and in this case I'm also asking for a random forest as a method and you'll see that this this step is one of those steps that does take a little bit longer to come back with the result. So I think you can already get a feel that you know Carrot is taking care of a lot of the details for you. We're going to see in just a moment the um, the range of the you know the number of models. that